Good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening to our guests. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> if you're on the East Coast, good somewhere. I don't know. Wherever you are in the world. Um, uh, um, bah, bah, bah. Welcome. Welcome to uh, the Game Developers uh, Conference uh, Twitch channel. Um, we are here. My name is Brian Francis. I'm usually much better at this. Um, I'm going to wander around this room for a second while I introduce us, then I'll start playing. Um, my name is Brian Francis. I'm a contributing editor at Gama Sutra. I'm the community manager for GDC, and I am here today streaming Control. Control did not come out this month, uh, to the best of my knowledge. It came out last year. But we are here playing Control today uh, for some very one very important reason, which is this game, the fine folks at Remedy Entertainment, have been nominated for several Game Developers Choice Awards. Those awards specifically are for uh, Best Audio, Best Narrative, uh, Best Technology, uh, Best in Visual Art, and uh, Game of the Year. It's also uh, picked up several on uh, honorable mentions. Um, I'll go ahead and drop the link to the full uh, nominations in Twitch chat. Um, and in the lower left-hand corner, to commemorate uh, this nomination, uh, are two developers from Remedy. Uh, on the left, we have Brooke Mags. And on the right, we Hello. have, oh god, oh no, this is it, I'm going to mess up the last name, Mikhail uh, Kesserunen. Mikhail, did I get that right? Uh, yes. Um, kind of, yeah. It was pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's a, it's a tricky Finnish name, so it's understandable. I'm going to go ahead and actually tw adjust my audio over here so that I, uh, I'm not, the, the shooting's not too loud. The shooting is really good. It really is best in audio. Um, Hi everyone, I can see in chat that we've got Mani uh, Maniac536 and we've got Remedy Games hanging out. Um, hi Remedy, um, <laughs> uh, you're, you're already here. Um, uh, yeah, we are here, like I said, we're commemorating the stream, but also we're taking the opportunity to catch up with Brooke and Mikhail and just, uh, we didn't get to do this last year when the game came out. Um, we're going to talk about the making of Control. Um, there's already been a lot of great interviews and features. Uh, about control, I totally suggest you Google around and check them out. But what we're doing today here is we're taking some of my questions about the making of control, um, and we are also taking your questions about the making of control. Um, uh, so if you have anything in particular you want to know more about, um, go ahead and drop your questions in Twitch chat, and I will ask them. Uh, for my part, however, I should start by letting Brooke and Mikhail introduce themselves. Uh, Mikhail, would you mind going first for me? Right, yes. So my name is Mikhail Kasurinen and um, I'm the game director on Control. And uh, I've been at Remedy for, well, almost 20 years now. I did a little tour in Sweden and went to other cities, but the majority of my career has been at Remedy. I worked on Max Payne 2, on Wake, uh, Quantum Break, and now Control is this, the latest one. Right on. And Brooke, would you uh, uh, introduce yourself for me, please? Yes, hello, uh, my name is Brooke, I'm a narrative designer on Control, and I moved here from Australia to work on this game, <laughs> basically, um, and it was my first AAA title, my background is in indie games and indie development, I was a freelancer uh, as well before that, so um, yes, making this game has been an absolute pleasure. Right on. Uh, as I work on some waste disposal here, I will uh, acknowledge me. You're doing a good job, you're cleaning up. Very well. Ati's going to be very impressed. Ati, he, he asked me to take care of this, so I take care of it. Yeah. Um, uh, I, 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 I worked on this side mission, actually, mm -hmm. uh, with the team. Um, it was a lot of fun, because we were thinking of things to do with um, for Ati as a, as a cool side mission, and <laughs> we thought about, wouldn't it be funny if the director of the bureau had to, like, take out the trash? <laughs> so, I, think, I think the director... I'm glad you're having a good time. Yeah. I think the director of any bureau should have to take the trash. Uh, well, that's, yeah. Um, hum humble oneself a little bit. Yeah, yeah the identity <laughs> of it was, was the key. And, and then he has, you know, the task for you that maybe seem a bit hmm, more than be, just taking out the trash. That's or right. Getting rid of the rodents and so on. So. <laughs> the rodents. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> Uh, we're actually going to be working on the clog uh, in just a second. Uh, for folks in chat, Maniac has asked us to talk about some spoiler workings where applicable. I will let folks know we're only going to be here for an hour. So uh, we're looking at, you know, basically the second hour of the game, second, third hour, uh, spoiler wise. I don't think we're hitting anything that I would consider a spoiler because I've finished the game um, and I know what's coming up. But if you're sensitive about that, feel free to drop the visual, listen on audio, whatever you need. 
um give a quick shout out to brian uh brian auto um uh, and hannah one uh who also are dropping by in chat like i said we're taking your guys questions feel free to drop them for us um and yeah oh man this i think i had this problem when i first played it too which is i don't know where the last barrel is don't tell me i'll find it there it is okay. um uh anyway uh what i need to do is i need to move on to the actual questions uh uh, Mikhail, uh, as game director of Control, uh, I would love to start by picking your brain about Control's origins, um, and if you wouldn't mind explaining how this game got started, and I'm gonna be blunt, like, Control is a really unique game, uh, it's got a really unique, uh, narrative, tone, vibe, but it also, like, has to balance some kind of con- not totally conventional, but familiar, um, uh, action tropes. So, do you mind, like, explaining like, the origins of the game and when you started balancing, like, this combination of- out there very out there concepts with uh conventional um gameplay yeah it's a, <clears throat> it's a it's a bit um like it has many aspects affecting that kind of um the root of why we created a game like this um we were coming out from a project where we wanted to have a uh, kind of uh uh, like a more uh, accepting a normal world, a bit more casual experience and so on. And um, we did on Wake before Quantum Break and we were kind of overall feeling like the next game we want to do is going to be a bit more like um, brave and, and take more risks and not be afraid of being a bit strange. And that mentality existed already uh, quite early on and before we even had any idea of what we wanted to do next. So, so it kind of, there was this certain kind of atmosphere that existed already that fed into this. And what was important to me personally was that uh, we start to create a game where we focus more on the world than on the kind of, uh, let's say, uh, narrative focused elements that we usually do. So it's less about the singular character, more about what is this place? What is its kind of uh, basic nature? And me and Sam, Sam Lake, so we started to concept uh, all of these different elements and that was the first decision kind of like, let's not even worry that much about the plot, let's not worry about the main character yet, let's just talk about what is this world? What is this place? What are the experiences that we want to have? And from that, uh, we came up with the bureau, uh, the his, and the uh, oldest house as a location, and so on. And, and the background for all of that was that we wanted it to be an experience that is unexpected, full of surprises, and we embrace the strange side of the supernatural elements and so on. And, and we're not afraid of going all out and what we don't want to have is that we we kind of explain everything that's happening and actually quite the opposite like we want to just show things and leave the interpretation for the player and of course you need to as a designer you need to provide like elements that people can see and start to draw conclusions and so on. so there was this kind of um acceptance that let's let's not explain let's not spoon feed and so on and once we kind of put those elements together and we started to see that, okay, here's a compelling package of elements that there's this exploration into strange phenomenon and we revolve around that. Uh, brutalism was there almost right from the get-go that it's an element that we want to have within the oldest house. And, and the side that we, we're not gonna explain everything. Let's just as player dive into this world and leave it upon them to, to kind of uh, understand what's happening. And, and from there, uh, we started to put the pieces together and start talking about, okay, what if, you know, uh, you're, you're kind of a director of this place? And actually, that was the first idea. And then the second idea was that maybe you're an outsider because we wanted to, because we wanted to be bold with the strange ideas, but if your character is already part of the world, then you don't have this view into this world uh, that the player has. So we wanted the main character to be a person who is an outsider to this world. But at the same time, we wanted them to belong. So yeah, you, you become the director like within the first five minutes of the, of the story. And a huge part of that was to give that lens into this world uh, through a character that can relate to you, understand that they're kind of experiencing all of this at the same time as you are. But at the same time, 
that character is now a fundamental aspect, part of this world as well. And getting to grips with all of that is a huge part of that journey that you take with Jesse. And um, yeah, I mean, we took something like six months, roughly, to concept all of these bits together. And it was pretty much just me and Sam talking, have a lot of discussions and putting core ideas together. And then came the time to actually start, you know, uh, creating the assets, creating demos and all of these elements that we needed to be able to uh, communicate further different ideas and so on. And yeah, from there we kind of went into the standard game development procedure and so on and that's how it came together. Right on. Uh, I, I, uh, before, uh, I do want to jump to Brooke and, and invite you to talk about your experience, but uh, Mikhail, I'm going to ask one more question, which is, um, obviously Remedy has a, a technology base and it has uh, a, a, a format of game development that it's more familiar with as a company. Um, how did you and your colleagues, oh man, I have to go around. Um, how did you and your <laughs> colleagues figure out, okay, I can use this weapon. Um, I have to give it back. Uh, how did you all come up with like this kind a, a format for balancing you know the work you need to do you know on making sure level made sense on making sure that gameplay felt like something that players could still understand in a weird world mm -hmm. while chasing that um uh uh chasing that sort of weird um that sensation mm -hmm. of, the, of the i think that you guys were saying the word new weird uh yeah uh, a lot when i was uh, hearing the marketing for this game yeah, New Weird was um, basically uh, a stance that we took into this world. Uh, it's, it is a literary genre, but uh, at the same time, it's not uh, just about, hey, let's have a strange world. It's uh, about the kind of a holistic behavior of characters within it and uh, how these different concepts come together and uh, this kind of avoidance of explain too much what's happening and, and leave a lot to interpretation. Uh, it, it was it was a challenge to balance out these type of elements together with the game that we want you to be able to understand quite quickly. Um, so that's why it was important that the core mechanics are seemingly simple, like telekinesis, for instance, being a core element of what Jesse can do. What I like about telekinesis is that it it is visually simple, it is easy to explain, like you conceptually get it, you understand what's happening, and there is a sense of uh, connection to the physical world. So it's not like completely alien, it's not like some force that enters the world that you don't understand, we would have to explain, and so on. There's none of that. You kind of get it quite quickly, what's happening and, and how it works. And that was crucial, that I wanted it to be an approachable, relatable, gameplay. You can pick up the controller, start playing, and you can start having fun really quickly. Uh, but then there's this other layer, where is the actual world itself? And that's filled with mystery and secrets, and even contradictions. Like sometimes you see a thing, and you think it works in one way, but then once you kind of dive further into it, you learn that, oh, it's not that simple, and so on. Um, so it was important for us to have these two layers, that there can be complexity and this kind of a depth to the world that can sometimes almost be impenetrable. but Playing the game should be fun, should be easy, should be intuitive. And uh, finding the right tone with the different missions, different side missions and all of that, that was a lot of iteration because we, we wanted to really follow thinking that let's not explain everything, let's let the player pay attention and, and that they feel like they should be paying attention and uh, kind of draw their own conclusions. So it was a huge balancing act of like, exercising restraint sometimes, like, no, we don't need to tell that and tell that and tell that, let's leave those things out. And it actually became stronger when you did these kind of decisions. Um, and and what maybe was uh, tough about it, because uh, as game designers, we want people to, to be able to jump in uh, and get it quickly. So sometimes it's required like, uh, like a specific attitude of like looking at the thing and asking questions, are we telling too much? And uh, that was, I think, a huge part of the process, and a lot of time went into that kind of iteration. Right on. Uh, I would. I got a million more questions about this kind of topic, but Brooke, I'm going to throw the question ball to you for a minute. Um, Brooke, sure. uh, your role in this game as narrative designer. Is my understanding uh, that you that you were able to join the game later on in the project. Um, yes. I would like to know. Uh, there's, there's, it is a 
it would be incorrect of me to say that games are you know plotted out at the start and figured you know then then just executed it on the way what's what is your narrative designer what is your goal coming into a project like this and and working figuring out story even though the game is already on the way can you talk about that yeah, that was um, that was really interesting, and it was it was a bit of a challenge too, I guess, because it's it was a brand new IP. Um, my first task really was to sink myself into the world <laughs> and to to understand all the concepts that had been set up that um, that we were just talking about, and and understand the the ins and outs of them. You know, what are objects of power, and what does the bureau do, and you know, who is Jessie, and why is she here, and like not only and know the story and know the characters and know the world you know that's been um so lovingly built um and then also understand what the tone is um i think that's pretty key actually mm -hmm. the the mood control is a moody game mm -hmm. and it, like it has a certain mood and tone to it that comes from the new weird genre which is not over explaining things which is elements of science fiction and fantasy but never you know, um, straying into either genre, like, completely. So coming onto the project, I remember, I actually remember having conversations with Sam about trying to understand certain parts, especially when then um, I'd sort of understood what was going on and then I was, you know, given some <laughs> areas of the game to sort of cut my teeth on, I suppose, and one of them was the motel sequences. And um, I even... I went, I think I went to Sam and I went to you mm -hmm. and I went to Stuart, our world design director, who um, all these people collectively sort of came up with these ideas and there was this legacy of ideas of what this was supposed to be and then what the tone should be. And then keeping that mood throughout development is um, a balancing act, as you say, yeah. because sometimes you just have to play it and review it and then say, well, I think that's actually over explaining the strangeness you know maybe right. we need to dial that back or now we've gone too obtuse and people don't get it so now we need to mm. you know spell things out a little bit more um so for me it was you know an exercise in wrapping my head probably around the largest narrative world for a game that i had taken on yet and then i guess embodying that information and i actually spent a lot of time because we were we were in the heat of production um, as part of something I did when I first started is I went to every room and introduced myself and said, what do you all do in this room and how can narrative help you? Um, and I actually incidentally picked up these questions that people had about the world um, that were, you know, pretty nuanced kind of questions, um, you know, so I didn't always know the answers, so I would collect them up, go back to the narrative room, we would sort of talk about you know, the answers and what that should be. And then I would sort of take them back to the team because the team don't necessarily have the time to delve into every sort of nook and cranny of the world that we in the narrative department have our, you know, um, great, you know, law sort of documents going on. Um, but sometimes they just need an answer quite quickly. And so then being able to convey that narrative mood and that information to them quickly and succinctly um, was was a lot of what I was doing and then also after that I took on the side missions and so part of my job was to understand the intent behind them um, to understand you know what they, this one is meant to say flesh out a character or it's meant to introduce an aspect of the world um, and then I would go through because a lot of it you know was sort of in partial production so I would go through and see what was there and meet the people who were working on it and find out what their design intent was and yeah sort of liaise between departments for for the side missions and for the motels um, and we I we definitely honed them a lot I would say in that time so yeah that's what I was doing <laughs> a yeah. lot of the time. I just want to say how amazingly important that work was because you were the glue between different departments, art, audio levels and so yes. on and kind of uh, 
finding also, I think, opportunity as well. Like, you know, we weren't maybe even thinking of highlighting certain things in certain quests, and then you kind of saw this, like, hey, what if we connect this and we bring that up there and so on. And that was, that was wonderful and, I think, hugely important to create this kind of a cohesive world that feels, like, connected and so on. So, yeah. Thank you very much. That's lovely to hear. Right on. Uh, <laughs> Obviously I'm... did a good job. <laughs> Right on. Uh, uh, I'm trying to do a good job as uh, director, director as director of the oldest house right now, but I uh, director of the Bureau of Control, I should say, not the oldest house. But I'm going to pause the game so I can get questions from chat because this ending is really hard. Um, I'm going to grab a question from Brian Otto, who would like to know who I believe is a speedrunner. Brian Otto would like to know, has the speedrun for Control uh, changed the way you, you all approach development at all? I will stack on that question, which is speedrunning has been a thing for a few years. I'm curious if speedrunning at all and its existence informed how you think about game development. Mikhail? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, I just want to say again how amazing that speedrun you know, <laughs> was. I, I really enjoyed it. Pretty it. Incredible. Uh, it, it was, so it was... It's a lot of fun. Um, I don't think it, at least to me, it, it doesn't really affect the way uh, we work on the game. Like it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a great thing to kind of observe and see, and, and you see the game through different eyes. So it's always great to have that perspective. And, um, and but I, I think fundamentally, I, I'm not personally looking at the game from that angle. And, and it's kind of hard to even imagine how would that even work because a huge part of speedrunning is uh, have this kind of attitude of let's see how much we can essentially break the game. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the whole idea. And, uh, and it's, it's weirdly uh, enjoyable to see that happening, even though it's, it's kind of uh, <laughs> makes you, your heart sink a bit like, oh no, that, <laughs> oh, that happened. And oh no, I didn't even know that was possible. But it's also fun at the same time. And, and what makes me personally excited about games is the improvisation. It is when people do things that you don't expect with your game. Mm -hmm. and, Actually, now that I think about it, uh, a huge part of Control's the vision for combat was that it is this physical space that we're giving to the player with a lot of low-level systems that work in a predictable physical way. So there's no like clean, clear rules that it always goes like this. There's this sense of looseness to, like you can pick up any physical object you want. We, we're not gonna judge, like well, let's, we're trying to make everything uh, functional and physical and behave in the way that you expect. And w with understanding that the risk is that we might not have perfected every single bit. We haven't probably checked every single possibility of what the players might do. And in a way, that was the intent. I, I wanted people to improvise, have fun, and uh, being able to see where people um, come up with ideas that you didn't even think of is fantastic. Uh, I love that, and especially speedrunners, that's the essence of what they're doing. So yeah, in a, in a way, we think about it, but I don't think it affects the game development per se, at least from my end. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um... Uh, we've I, I uh, I'm very happy with a piece I did on Gamus for a while back, um, interviewing some developers who work with speedrunners to get their game done. But obviously that's the exception, not the rule. Um, now uh, while I beat these hits up, I am going to re pause to jump. Oh, actually, yeah, there's a good question in chat from Righteous, uh, who would like to know: Did the layout of this game begin as more of an action game with set piece elements like Half Life, or as a hero shooter combining powers like Prototype or Singularity? Oh, sorry. What was the uh, actual question? So the, uh, the question, I, the question, did the how did this game sort of begin to come together? Was it more oh. uh, set piece driven, like okay, uh, or was it more like we're going to develop these powers and then develop sort of develop set pieces around them? And you mentioned in your answer just a second ago that this is a, you know, you have low level rule, you know, powers with rules yeah. that work everywhere. Um, right. With, I see, yeah, it's, it wasn't about set pieces, it, it was about the world itself and then uh, finding compelling elements that you can discover yourself within this world and, and less about constructing uh, certain type of moments for the player and, and instead like, you know, let the player 
uh, be the ones that uh, figure out how to go through it, what to do, and so on, and and kind of stay out from their way. I, I think as much as possible. Um, sure enough, like when when you look at uh, set pieces in the in the kind of a sense as uh, let's say boss fights or uh, the uh, objects of power that you discover. In a way, yes, that kind of thinking uh, existed early on. But the whole idea was that. It's like, you know, the boss fights in Dark Souls that they kind of exist there, you can discover them and so on, but they are not necessarily uh, like a bigger set piece moments like connected to the story and so on, and more to the world and gameplay instead. I think it's probably true too that we we knew that we were going to make a game with, you know, gunplay and abilities, but we also knew that the world would, well, it's, it's all set inside one location, but it's um, a very interesting kind of winding, shifting, strange location that you can explore. And I know a lot of the world development um, that Stuart and the team did to build out the oldest house, thinking of it as a government bureau and going, okay, well, if they're studying, you know, the supernatural and unexplained, what kind of departments would they possibly have? And then um, you know, then we had the research sector and then what, what would go inside the research sector and then um, it's also about the combination of making that space large enough to be enjoyable with those abilities. Mm -hmm. um, but also, for example, I know one of the reasons that um, Stuart and Jan Nega sort of went with brutalism is because um, it's very straight, clean lines that actually works really well when the players are running around, you know, kind of destroying things with their abilities. Like the environment is is more readable in that way. If the environment was super busy all the time, it would be really hard. So it's all been really considered in terms of how it's designed. And for example, in the maintenance sector, you have the huge, um, the huge power reactor, which is a sort of a set piece in and of itself, right. I guess. Um, so yeah. each area is very has its own character. Like I know that style guides were put together for the color palette of each sector, for the, what the lines on the floor will say, for what kind of signage you know the maintenance mm -hmm. sector uses compared to the research sector, because there would be different people there. They would need to know different things. So. Um, yeah, and then how the oldest house opens up over time mm. to, um, you know, uh, is ties into the gameplay pretty closely as well. So you you always have reason to come back through different sectors as well. So that influenced the way that the game was was created. Uh, I'm going to ask a follow-up question kind of about the space of game. Uh, one of the cool things about the oldest house is that it sort of lets the player in on the secret that level design games is a giant, you know, it doesn't hallways aren't hallways uh area elevators aren't actually elevators you know like yeah <laughs> when, when leveling games are uh made they do not follow real world logic by no. from what the player sees and what's going on behind the scenes what was it like like sort of making a space for both of you uh, i'd love to hear both your thoughts on this that uh sometimes just this can it, like the opening area of the game not t first unlocks the elevator for you is a perfect example like it doesn't make sense and yet it's working uh, well, a huge part of the the style or feel that we wanted to have that there's this conflict or collision of strange and mundane, and we wanted to avoid like let's just have strange stuff and then acting strange. What made it interesting is that it's familiar, something that you can recognize and understand, like an elevator. But then, as you use it, you discover that okay, something else, something more complicated is going on that you're having a hard time understanding. So. Uh, and you, you can see that through the entire game that most of the stuff is, it is uh, kind of uh, taking something that you can really like understand and then turning it into something surprising and so on. That's the feel you're going to have, the feel of unexpected. Mm. And I know a lot of the level designers kind of really got creative with that as well. Mm. Um, you know, in the research sector, for example, there are quite a few environment secrets. And I remember working with Anna Marie and she was telling me all of these things that was possible for players to do if they use the launch ability to stack things up and they could be able to get into a certain area or something like that. Like she was really thinking through how players would 
play the space, um, but then also what creative things you could do given the strange nature of the oldest house. So I think it um, it sort of freed up level design a little bit in a way to, to you know, do that. But then also from a, from a story perspective, so the motels are basically the motel sequences are a way for players to get from one area of the oldest house to another to open up areas and spaces. And this whole idea of um, of having this transient space that you access with a light switch cord, <laughs> you go to a motel in a completely different area mm-hmm. um, outside the oldest house and solve some puzzles to to then get the key to get back to a different part. Like I, I don't think that would have been, you know, that's not that's something that our world allows for, which is allows us to be more creative. I would mm-hmm. say. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, Brooke, I should also, while I'm here, I should mention that you're giving a talk at GDC. Uh, I am, Which yes. is a talk about the making of the Ocean View Hotel, Motel. So if you're going to GDC, or if you just like keeping an eye on our uh, um, uh, GDC Vault, GDC YouTube channel, uh, keep an eye out for that talk. Um, it is probably going to be pretty good. Um, while I am beating up the enemies, uh, I'm going to give... Uh, this is going to be a tough question to sort out, but I'd like to give... Uh, Hakigel and uh, Billy the Kit or uh, Maniac Five Three Six, just a brief nod because they've been really good viewers. Say um, they are asking about the possibility of either an art book and also finding out what is behind the redacted sections of some of the arts of, of the of the um, collectibles, which I have been skipping over. Um, I find that they're redacted. The point of yeah. it is that you can't find out. But that being said, Brooke, I will let you as uh, I'll take designer, that one. Yeah, how do you I feel say, about those redacted stuff and letting players find their information? I well, I mean, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun writing them. Um, but I would say that that is top secret information that's probably been lost forever, unfortunately. <laughs> or it's been redacted for it's a reason. It's been redacted for a reason. It's yeah, very yeah. top secret, important stuff that cannot be revealed. <laughs> Lore, lore uh, explanations on game dev chats. Okay, I need to move on. Um, uh, if for information about an art book, I would uh, invite uh, the folks from Indie Games to. Sorry, sorry to that on you. Uh, just uh, if you want to reply to that one, I need to leave that to you. Um, anyway, uh, Mikhail, we only have so much time with you left, so I do want to squeeze in some more questions. Um, uh, what? With a team like the one you have, uh, like, you know, this really talented team of creative people um, working as hard as they can to put out an interest, you know, to execute the vision that you and Sam uh, and your board director, whose name I'm blanking on, came up with. Um, what do you feel, I like asking directors this question, what do you feel is essential to communicating the, your, the reason behind your yeses and nos for people? Because obviously you sort of have the authority to go yes, no, yes, no to everything they they throw at you. But what's the difference between just arbitrarily toss handing down yeses and nos on what they make versus expl- <laughs> explaining and shepherding, you know, and making a, a, a an even better product, I guess? That's totally right. You just, you just drop the hammer and go, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, uh, that, that, actually, he doesn't. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, sometimes you need to start with that, and, and but you need to, you're responsible for making people understand the reasoning behind it, and, and you want you want to take the extra time to make sure that everybody's comfortable with that decision. Uh, what's tricky with control is that it embraces certain kind of philosophies and ideas that, yes, you can say them out loud, like early on in production, and say these are the key elements that we should all uh, look at and think about and, and so on. But then when it kind of comes to actual execution, when you actually start to build things, uh, you realize that there are a lot of things that are not clear cut. There, mm-hmm. There is this gray zones and a lot of things that are less for interpretation. Yeah. And um, so so that, that I think made it this tough and there was a need to quite often have these sit downs where we kind of like, okay, let's, let's talk through this concept and kind of Sometimes it is about finding the answer together. And a huge part of what's really important to me with control was that um, that we, we don't work in a way where uh, me and Sam, like we produce a screenplay, just give it to people like, okay, do this game. That's, that's not what I want. I don't think that's what we wanted. 
Uh, a huge part of it was to uh, establish that this is the world we want to create. Here are the high-level rules that we want to uh, follow, and then give the team uh, this kind of a sandbox to play in, that they can start building uh, their ideas on what kind of side missions we could have and so on. A lot of the ideas in control are actually directed from the team themselves. And, uh, and it's, it's kind of, uh, it's good for creativity. A lot of ideas I or Sam would never come up with. And, and that's wonderful. That's exactly what we want. But then there is this importance to do a follow. Like, you know, a uh, huge part of my job is to ensure that the end result is cohesive. It kind of makes sense. Sometimes it might be hard to see how it makes sense, but you feel it and it's there. Even the weirder stuff that you see in the game feels like it belongs there. And that's not an accident. That's, that's us carefully considering all these different aspects we're doing. And, and that's the basis of reasoning that I'm trying to, trying to provide. And, um, and sometimes there are things that are just, I'll be honest, sometimes it's like uh, you just have to kind of realize it. You, have to, you kind of just know what's the right direction. And, and of course, I spend a lot of time trying to explain it. Uh, but sometimes it's, it kind of can be like, uh, tonally, this is the right way to go. Mm -hmm. and, and there needs to be that kind of a higher level direction sometimes that adjusts different types of things. So, yeah, complicated, but yeah. But it's it. time well spent, isn't it? Because when oh, yeah. you spend the time to explain why you're making a decision, then it helps clarify the direction and the mood and the thing that we're yeah. going for. Now, I remember when, when I first came to Remedy, um, Sam took the time to take us through the narrative presentation, um, which basically sort of summed up the world for us and like introduced us to, you know, what you guys had been creating and sort of introduced us to the characters. I didn't sort of just, oh, I'm here. I'll just, you know, go off and read about this, I guess. You know, they, they take the time and you even did a, um, it was like a creative game overall overview mm -hmm. update for mm -hmm. us and presented it to us, the whole team, um, which was talking about the key pillars of the game and what you wanted to get across and, you know, what it was about and, like, the physicality of the powers mm. uh, and the, um, you know, the strangeness of the um, entities in the world. All of that kind of stuff yeah. helps. Like, I think, um, I think that the um, leadership here spends a lot of time on that because... Um, it's it's such a remedy thing, I guess. Like we have these very um, interesting, complex worlds um, that you know take take some time to like mm. get, I guess, yeah, get across. Um, and especially because Control um, was a new IP and is doing different things, yeah. gameplay and world wise. Mm. Um, so that I imagine required like a lot more sort of considering on how you would communicate that and get that across. For sure. That's, 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 I think, is one of the hardest parts. When you are creating a new IP, basically none of it exists. And uh, you really have to do the legwork to justify your reasons. Like, you can't just come up with things. You have to have the, the kind of uh, fundamental thinking uh, to be, like, solid behind everything that you're saying. And yeah, that took uh, took a lot of time. But at the same time, you want to kind of leave wiggle room for the team to mm. uh, be creative and have that little sandbox where they can come up with uh, a lot of new ideas as well. Mm. Right on. That was, I think, a really good answer. Um, I'm going to give a quick shout to Billy the Kid 3, who says they bought two uh, copies of this game for two of their friends for Christmas and got the special edition for themselves. <laughs> Uh, thank you. <laughs> nice, thank you. Um, uh, uh, some other shout outs to uh, Maniac 536, who seemed to have a big love for the Easter eggs in this game. Uh, my partner, who uh, played this game with me and was a big Alan Way fan, immediately made sure uh, after, because she played it and got ahead of me, and she's like, okay, you need to go to the Alan Wake room. And I'm like, uh, I never played Alan Wake. <laughs> and, I went, and she went, what? And she still made me go there. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, I guess it's a spoiler that is now on the room. Oh man, this is one of my research, central research. This is one of my favorite. All right, central I, research. I love this. Is my favorite lobby. I really like this. Oh, one. yeah, so I, just yes. say, yes. I do. <laughs> um, uh, I also, I also love the Dr. Darling videos there. 
yeah well man we're getting into the dr darling stuff it's so good yeah um uh yeah uh we only have a few minutes left with uh mccall so i'm going to uh brooke i'm gonna throw some questions your way in a moment but i want to give mccall a chance okay. to talk with our yeah. audience today um mccall uh i am going to um uh when i started playing this game i realized that you could secretly call it a metroidvania um uh because there's a sense of, just like in metroid or castlevania um you get upgrades those upgrades reopen areas in old sections for you oh no there's too many rockets stop it um uh and that means the level design for this game is not a straightforward adventure but a you know uh like you said so like you've described today it's a world that players can learn more about both literally they can learn narrative things hold yeah. still um and uh <laughs> they can also learn how to move within it which is they when they revisit old zones and use their abilities to go new areas i do not like what's happening right now um give me, health. Give me health. anyway uh yeah would you mind oh would you mind <laughs> explaining the process <laughs> of, of of creating uh, areas that players can re-explore and backtrack through without feel like they're wasting time yeah, I mean, it, there's this responsibility that we all bear that we want to create an interesting place. And that was a huge part of the thinking that we had from the get-go that, I mean, uh, looking back, like we came from Quantum Break and it's a linear story-driven game. A lot of spaces were built with a purpose in mind, but you can't just run through them in 10 seconds, you never return and so on. It was actually interesting. I felt like when we work in quantum that we, we spent actually a lot of time justifying the existence of different things you see in the world. There's a lot of lore, there's a lot of stories behind them and so on. And to me at the time, it almost felt like uh, we, we spent all of this time kind of building this framework, this construct of ideas that is expressed within the place that you go through, but then the place just kind of blasts through them, kills everybody and moves on to the next room. And, and it, it, was a, it was a bit of a shame, I felt. And when you look at control, I think, you know, you're seeing elements that we've already been doing in, in, in our previous games, you know, kind of more linear games. So I think the, the kind of uh, understanding and know how, how to create a compelling environment already existed. But the problem that we've had is that we always done that kind of a linear story driven thing. We're driven by the action. We're driven by the story. We need to move on to the next bit and so on. So it, it was a big change, honestly, to us to kind of change that thinking that, no, you're here for the world, you're here to explore. It's like, let's give the player the uh, chance to discover. And when when that landed, like when people really took it, like, yes, it's, it's not about thinking where the next trigger is. It's not about, you know, where the next cinematic will happen. It is about the space itself. Mm -hmm. And through that thinking, uh, great things started to happen. We get these themes like the trees in the middle of this space, for instance, that kind of grounds it, that acts as a kind of an anchor point, and it kind of leads into different directions. You always return to this central area and so on. It led to that kind of a very visual thinking. It's connected to the lore of the world. It's connected to all these uh, different things that you discover, yes, in the story as well. So, yeah, it, it kind of happened organically, but it had to happen through a process where everybody was able to uh, knowingly step back and away from how we thought about things before and embrace the idea that the focus should be on the space instead of uh, just the kind of a core narrative piece that kind of a linear arc we usually go through. And once that happened and once we kind of continued iterating, it, it kind of just came together. It's kind of weird when I think about it because this is a massive change that we did in the way of thinking. And yeah, I think a huge part of that is that kind of a know-how and understanding that we already created in the previous games that we did. Right on. Uh, oh man, I could tell uh, so many questions, so many observations at you right now. Um, just like, I couldn't get over just in this fight, for instance, how this they all spawn in this corner. You're fighting in this corner. The walls that you're looking at right here drive you like visually to look in this corner. So it was easy for me. This fight was quote unquote easy because I could like just sort of focus yeah. on everything. Um, there's so much about control that I think is so cool. We're celebrating, and that's probably why it picked up so many nominations uh, at the Game Developer Choice which I forgot to mention, are on March 18th, and you can watch it on here on Twitch, or you can attend the show at GDC this year if you come. Uh, sorry for the, for the 
Brie Schilling. Um, Mikhail, before you go, uh, and we're going to have some time with Brooke before I shut down the stream. Uh, uh, I'm going to share one observation I had, and I'm curious about your thoughts about it. What, what separates Control for me from a lot of other video games is that this game kicks off with a different kind of empowering premise that ties back to what you talked about with, with this world that we're trying to explore and this um, mm -hmm. everything, which is the idea that... Um, you were right. Like, this is a theme that I feel from the minute the game starts. Uh, there's the sense of validation that comes with Jesse's story and uh, the way you explore this world, which is, you know, as you pass through dead letters, as you read the collectibles, you get the sense that, you know, there was a conspiracy. You were mm -hmm. hurt as a kid. There was a cover-up. You were separated from your brother. People were acting with bad intentions around you. There's something really empowering in a way for that that's different than other games I've played. A lot of games, you know, you get stronger, you... Or you start weak, you become strong. That's that's a great kind of empowerment. Um, you can look at games like Devil May Cry 5, where you start strong, lose your powers, and then have to regain. And it's a huge part of our behavior. And and um, yeah, and I, I think there's something really interesting and unique in that. And I was in love with that idea. Uh, I think the moment was set out loud. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge part of the experience. Oh man, this is a fun room, but I don't have time to do it. Um, <laughs> that is a fun room. Yeah, uh, old, god, uh, old god of Asgard. That's it. Um, yeah. Shout, yes. out, shout out to the old guards of Asgard, but you said they don't have time to uh, witness your glory today. Um, with that, uh, Nicole, um, uh, thank you for joining us. I, I understand you have to duck out. Uh, thank you for yes. your insightful answers about directing control. Um, congrats on all the nominations. And uh, yeah, that's that's about that's all I got for now. Um, Brooke, we will chat with you for the rest of our time sure. today. Um, okay, yeah. excellent. Goodbye. All right. Bye bye. <laughs> thank you. Have a good it was a lot evening. of fun. Yes. <laughs> I'm out. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, uh, yeah, Billy the Kid wants to say thanks to McCall. Um, and, uh, it's funny, the, the stream going down broke my entire flow of game. So now I'm just wandering around this area uselessly. Um, uh, no, you're doing you're doing well. You're, you've, you can see an area that's a little bit kind of interesting and curious over there. Yeah, I remember. I'm trying to remember if this is something you do now or if you do it later. Because it's the stupid. That's a good question. I think it's later. Yeah. Well, let's try and get over there. Oh. Oh. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, uh, but that was actually an interesting challenge with um, with narrative and level design and game design all paired together is that question, which is, can the players access this now? <laughs> So that's not necessarily something we came up against in previous games because, of course, they were a little bit uh, more linear in the way that you move through the spaces like um, Mikhail was talking about before. Mm -hmm. But um, in, we would have to work closely, more closely with the other departments in terms of, okay, so what does the player know in the story? Which characters have they met? What could they potentially uncover? <laughs> and then make sure that we distributed, for example, the optional content or those documents accordingly and make sure we didn't spoil anything that might come later um, if players could sort of decided not to you know do main missions one after another and explored and went to side missions we had to make sure that you know all of those secrets were well kept <laughs> so um for example there uh Anna marie made sure that drop would kill you, <laughs> you didn't thanks sure. Anna marie <laughs> But mainly so that, you know, you don't uh, necessarily spoil things for yourself either. But, yeah, we, we had to be careful about that, actually. Right um, so that was interesting. That was an interesting challenge. Brooke, um, while I got you here, one of my favorite things to ask uh, narrative designers about is uh, I often feel very strongly that the content of games is informed by the tools they are made. So I'm curious, especially as someone who, you know, gets to make the Ocean View Motel, how you felt that uh, working with, um, I don't know if you work directly with the Northlight engine or if you're using other tools with it, uh, but I'm curious how you felt as a storyteller, your ability to uh, execute the vision that McCall was talking about was affected by uh, how you were making it. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally wasn't jumping into the engine. I mean, I did I did a lot of playtesting and I did a lot of build reviews and things like that. Um, one of our other narrative designers was doing a lot of um, the, uh, we, we have a tool that we use um, 
to to do a lot of that stuff that had to do with dialogue and pacing. I, I well, I lie. I did use the tool um, to do a lot of the optional content setup and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really interesting. Funnily enough, there were some interesting limitations around how we could um, make the documents work with the text. And I actually think that that was really helpful because it meant that we were like, okay, so um, we can do a lot of documentation, but we can't put heaps of pictures on them because of the way the tool works. We could put some, but it, but it actually, you know, made us be creative with the idea of what kind of funny like office documentation would you find around mm -hmm. um, and um, actually being quite spare with the amount of words that we could use as well. Um, so we really just had that sort of one page to use. We, you know, some games sort of let you flick through pages. Um, so we had to be pretty sparing, which I think was good. I think that limitation meant that we had snappier, you know, documents to read. And there are quite a few to read, but they don't, take a long time in and of themselves. Um, so that was interesting. Um, but then also for me, for my work, a lot of what I was doing was um, doing a lot of the vision holding for the side missions So and for the motel, which I'll talk about in my talk. But for the side missions, um, Clay, uh, our writer, one of our writers would be in the room with me and they would be taking notes of what Jessie needs to sort of say or take note of or... Um, what she might say to help players along in the particular side mission. And a lot of what I was doing was often walking between departments, talking to the level designer and sound design, getting a list of animations that we need for those side missions, getting lists of like, and getting that sent off so they could be mo-capped and things like that. So a lot of like detail orientated work to make sure that the narrative is being carried across in the, um, the whole mission, but it's not necessarily to do with um, just the dialogue. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, making sure all of that is accounted for and then letting Clay know that, you know, Jesse will need to do something in this side mission, I don't know, like um, turn off the clog or, I don't know, solve a puzzle with the radio and so then she needs a line that's probably specific to that. Um, so a lot of that is feeding information to the people, you know, that what they need to be able to do their particular thing. Um, so that's that's a lot of my work in in the development part, anyway. Yeah. Let's close. Let's close off this chat. Um, uh, folks in chat have been asking uh, great questions. Um, uh, but I'm going to close off uh, with a little bit of a tease for your talk uh, about the Ocean View Motel. Um, yes. What I would like to know is the Ocean View, you mentioned that the Ocean View Motel is a transit space. It lets you sort of pick up the player from one area and move them to another with this in-between zone of passing through, you know, a sort of Pacific Northwest motel. And we're getting a great look at the lobby today. Um <laughs> It's when you're lobby. in that space, you do some of the most interesting, like, like it sort of underlines the theme of the game in a very specific way, which is, you know, the, the odd interacting with, with mundane objects creates dramatic consequences. Um, mm. And uh, I would just like to know, what was your process for architecting the little interactions and what, and then the little, I guess, like, the, you know, they have these, like, supernatural payoffs a little bit. Um, yes. Because uh, yeah, things get eerier as you go on. Um what was your process for coming up with some of those? Yes, yeah, so some of the, so when I jumped onto the motels, there were prototypes for puzzles for them. Um, and some of them were really great. And I took elements of them and redesigned them only because some of them had fallen out of the narrative mood and tone. So they, they were a little bit too obvious, but the reason for that was they were somewhat placeholder saying like put a mysterious cool puzzle here and this is what it could look like um and then i went ahead and worked with um the different level designers and sort of proposed my own puzzle designs that were um simpler admittedly but also um a bit weirder and then I can't completely take credit for the puzzles themselves because I would have an idea and talk to the level designer about them and then they would have suggestions about how to make it more readable and work better technically. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we would go back and forth on that. But, um, and a lot of what I would do is um, pitch like 
the props for the motels and the environment and talk about what it should look and feel like. And I worked with um, our environment artist, Mikey, and sort of sat with her and, you know, we looked at things together and reviewed it together. Um, so that was that was really fun. And then some of the motels are really specific and have a very specific theme. Um, I don't know how much I should say so as not to spoil, but um, so feel those free, ones... Uh, if it's like the, from the first couple of motel levels, like, feel free to spoil it just because the game's been out for okay. a minute. Well, so, um, well, the Arti Motel, for example, there's one that's got a very Finnish theme to it um mm -hmm. and so we were for the longest time thinking about what that should feel like and sam had some pretty clear ideas for it so it was making sure that we were delivering on that um for him and i also worked with the sound designer to design the stinger for the when you successfully solve a puzzle like what that should sound like mm -hmm. because um it's really tempting to be really uh, obvious or on the nose, but because you're getting a strange pyramid key from the board, we we sort of figured that something that sounded like that would be really cool. And, you know, some of my um, happiest moments on the game is, you know, sitting with these other um, super talented people and helping them and, and them helping me realise the, the vision for the motel sequences. So it's going to be a real pleasure to talk about it and delve into detail for the for the talk so yeah uh yeah. for that uh for folks who are able to gc march 16th through the 20th if you look at the, your screen you will see the date on the upper left hand corner um uh you can check out brooks's talk uh it's not scheduled yet i don't know what day and time it is i'm sorry uh but that's okay I'm i don't know either for, so it would yeah. be a complete mystery yeah I'm sorry <laughs> no. <for> everything um <laughs> that's uh, fine yeah, uh, with that, I'm going to start wrapping up our stream. Thank you all. Oh my god, <laughs> I still have my connect plugged in and I thought I yelled at it. Um, uh, um, uh, with that, <laughs> I'm going to start wrapping up our stream. Thank you everyone for rolling Thank with you so our much, everyone. surprising technical difficulties today. Congratulations to Brooke, McCall, and everyone else at Remedy, Sam, and a lot of the folks who worked on this game. Um, uh, I'm friends, I'm personal friends with, um, uh, one of the people who worked, uh, in pre-production on the writing, Anne Gill, uh, Threshold, oh, Threshold awesome. Kids and all that, um. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I'm so sorry we didn't get to show them off today, because they are one of my favorite things about this game, too. Um, yeah, shout out to them, shout out to everyone who worked really hard, uh, to bring this game to life, uh, through all parts of the process. Um, uh, with that, I need to do my shilling for who we are and what we do. We are Game Developers Conference. Uh, thank you folks for tuning in. If, if you're not a game developer, you should know that we go live regularly. In fact, we're going live later today. We're doing two streams today, um, where we are going to be interviewing the folks from the Outer Wilds team. Uh, Mobius. Oh, amazing. Uh, yeah, that game is so cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, that'll yeah. be fun. <laughs> they have also been nominated from Game Developers Choice Awards. I'm sorry. I guess you're competing with them, but hey, you know, everyone would. Well. At the GCA. Yeah. Um, uh, what a compliment to be competing with them. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so we're going to be talking with them starting at uh, 3 p.m. EST. That's uh, 12 p.m. Pacific. Um, I don't know. Any other time zones from that, that's up to you to figure out. Um, from there, uh, so if you hit the follow button, you'll get a notification when we go live. If you'd like to attend GDC, you can totally um, uh, just hit the uh, button at the bottom of the screen. I've set up a button down there so you can get your pass. Um, if you want to check out, uh, is your talk in the Narrative Summit or is it somewhere else? In the Narrative Summit. Yeah, if you're in the Narrative Summit, you'll, you'll want to get a Summit's Pass to see Brooks talk. Um, but if you get anything from an expo, you can attend the awards on the 18th, no matter what badge you have. Um, so you should totally do that. Um, and if you're not going to attend the awards, like, if you're not going to attend the show, in person, like I said, uh, it'll be streaming live on Twitch, so you can watch there. So you could, you should follow for that reason too. Uh, that's what's happening. Awesome. There's more people spawning. <laughs> You're doing a good job. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, talking, yeah. And interviewing, and and playing. Games. I know. I don't know how you do it. Uh, <laughs> this is really good. Clever. Good, I'm just saying it's a good. Thing I played this game once already. Oh, Doctor Darling. Um, Sweet. There he is. <laughs> uh, Maniac 536. Uh, this stream will eventually be archived on YouTube. That technical glitch we had earlier may mean I can't just push a button and send it over. I may need to uh, hop into video editor and stitch it back together. Um, uh, with that in mind, uh, I would like to thank everyone for watching. Thank you, Brooke and the folks at Remedy for setting the stream up. And I cannot wait uh, to see your talk at GDC. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.
Have a good day, everyone, and enjoy your adventures in the oldest house. And if you're going to stick with us for the Outer Wilds, uh, drop. Hey, see you in a couple hours. Bye. <laughs> Bye.